I believe in order to be inspired, you've got to be a bit bored. It's the little things in life that fascinate me, the little annoyances and little victories. Quite often it'll be stupid little things that inspire me, like that constant nagging feeling when you leave the house, whether you've left something on. So I'll try and create an image that sums that up. And for me, if I can't kind of sum up the meaning of that image through the artwork and a title, for me, that artwork's failed. I grew up in Castletown with what can only be described as a crazy amount of freedom. And whenever it rained, I'd just stay in and draw. But I suppose the stuff I learned the most of it, I remember my dad must have picked it up secondhand somewhere from a car boot sale. It's like this encyclopedia of birds. I remember copying birds out there and always giving them like extra legs and more eyes and stuff. And then I think when I hit my early teens, I discovered rock music and thus all the amazing artwork you see on like those albums. I always remember all through my art education just getting told, don't look at that stuff, it's awful. And now people are starting to see the merit of it. When I left high school, I went to the Isle of Man College to study art and got really disillusioned with it. I was only allowed to do art two days a week and it wound me up. I got chucked out of college quite early on and then I went off and I had five years of fairly shitty jobs, though some of them gave me a lot of time to think. And I think I thought of some of my best ideas that have come into my art from back then. When I reached about 21, I got a bit tired of all the little Hitlers I used to work for. I went back to college. Thankfully things had changed, so I was on a full-time art course and I was able to do art full-time. Turned out I was actually quite good at this art malarkey. Illustration was kind of everything. I wanted to do and I went to Falmouth which at the time was the best place in the UK to study illustration. That really opened my eyes, they were very industry focused, they really taught you how to actually make a living as a creative. We even learned how to fill in your tax form and it led to all sorts of things you know like I did book covers, I did editorial work, I've done stamps, I've worked on animations, I've worked in film, it's been crazy. When I first started out professionally in my 20s I was against any kind of formalism or realism in my art so everything was like super stylized and I used to throw collage into my painting and things like that. It was, was kind of like an act of rebellion really. I always remember a tutor telling me you should never paint with black so I used to underpaint everything black and I think through through dumb luck you know that got me noticed in the world of illustration a little bit. Definitely when I started out over here I got an awful lot of people and other artists telling me people won't get it, it's not going to sell and I always remember the first solo show I did and it pretty much sold out. There's a lot of people who know my work and kind of get what it's about and that's spread across you know all genders and ages. A lot of people say you know I like looking at a piece and finding my own story and that's great but the illustrator in me is is very much like no this is what I'm trying to say, this is what I want you to see. And I work very hard to try and make sure that that comes across. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But as long as people like the work, I can't say that I'm too bothered about that, really. When you're doing an illustration, so you're working for somebody and the, the artwork's got a job to do, obviously you take the client's thoughts and feelings and advice into account. But when I'm doing stuff, it's just me talking about stuff that bothers or inspires or, or, or intrigues me. I, I don't know, I don't really pay much attention to anyone else. One thing I have learned is everyone has an opinion on art and I don't know whether it's just me, but they always seem to tell me. It's what I have to say, it's how I want to say it. If you like it, fantastic, join the club. If not, you know, there's plenty of boring Manx landscapes to look at over here. I've never encountered any feeling uh, high or anything that equates to the same level of feeling that you get when you finish a painting and it, it just works. It's a sense of achievement, it's a sense of fulfillment, it's a sense of happiness, and it doesn't matter who else is around you, or if nobody's around you, that feeling is what I end up chasing, and it's really good. I've always had quite an eclectic practice, and I find inspiration in a lot of different things. I can be inspired by my surroundings and my experiences, the emotions that I'm feeling at a particular time in my life. Something that you've read, or having a conversation with someone, seeing a piece of art by another artist, listening to a song. All of these things can influence me sometimes. 
having lived the first 19 years of my life on the Isle of Man, and then moving to Cornwall to study, my surroundings and my emotions were crucial to the work that I made during my first year. It was very much a manifestation of my homesickness. I recorded myself in my uni halls, stood halfway in my wardrobe, singing a traditional Manx song called Ushag Vegroy, which my mum used to sing to me to help me fall asleep. I was so homesick in that tiny, tiny bedroom. And the memory of her singing that song to me was so much stronger than it had ever been before. And so memories like that ended up featuring really heavily in the work that I was making. I think a lot of the time, inspiration is also pure chance. I've certainly found that over the past year. A lot of the work that I've been making has occurred completely by chance, but it's the work that I'm the most proud of that does feel the most genuine. I'm not trying specifically to please an audience or to create something for aesthetic reasons or to solely create something in the opposite sense that isn't supposed to look good and that's meant to delve into some important social issue. And in doing that, I think it has also become the most experimental body of work that I've made so far. I like my work to be quite playful. A phrase that I always really like is focused play. Experimentation is really important and there's no point making work if you're just stressing. I think making work for the sake of making work is such a dangerous thing to be doing. You really do just psych yourself out and then you don't end up making anything. I can feel quite restless sometimes when I stay still in what I'm doing. In my work, there is a particular focus on the reclamation of traditional women's crafts, particularly embroidery and tapestry making. I've been embroidering as a hobby for a fair few years now, and it wasn't until partway through my degree that I started using embroidery as an art form in its own right. I find it very therapeutic. It's such a repetitive thing. It's so process-based and so physically involved but it gives your mind a chance to relax while your hands create something. I was brought up prioritising both art and music. My parents are both very artistic people and they really drove home the importance of being creative from such an early age. They would take me to art galleries, put a sketchbook in my hand, encourage me to sit there for as long as I needed and just draw. They'd take me to gigs and festivals. It's just always been right there. I've been playing guitar since the age of five. I started writing my own music when I was about 15 or 16, and I've been writing ever since. I've been making art for just as long as I've been making music, but up until recently, I always viewed them as very distinctly separate from each other. I never quite realised that you could make a connection, a bridge between the two. But I quite like the fact that I make music in the same way that I make art. It is all very free-flowing and spontaneous. Moving forwards, I know I want to explore this fusion of art and music further. But I think it's okay to not have everything perfectly mapped out. I never really thought of inspiration as a concept, certainly not when I first started to paint. The question why didn't enter my mind either. All I know is that I had to do it. I had to express the pain and the sudden loneliness born out of my father's absence. I didn't care if it was good or not. It wasn't about standard or approval, and it certainly wasn't about painting pretty pictures. I wasn't painting for anybody but me. And all I wanted was to get closer to the truth. One day, as I was visiting my mom, she came to me. I've got something to tell you, she said carefully. Your dad died a few months ago. Now, even though I had no recollection of him, that news hit me hard, real hard. 
only came to me much later that that was the defining moment in my life and later in my career. Suddenly, there was this huge black cloud surrounding me and it stayed with me for a very long time. Around the same time, I came across the work of 19th century romantic painter Caspar David Friedrich, a man who had an intense relationship with nature, death and isolation, and who painted it for most of his life. It's almost like I had been given permission to express my loss. I don't shy away from my emotions. When it comes to creativity, they are my most valuable asset. I know that If I want to, I can turn those emotions into creative fuel. I've been through it many times, and it's often where my best work comes from. The process is quite intense, as one can imagine. I have to be totally on my own in the studio for a long period of time, only stopping to eat and sleep. I turn off all distractions and make myself unavailable for the whole duration of the project. I usually need between 8 and 10 hours every day for as long as it takes and music of course carefully chosen to help me release the emotions for a very long time I was desperately trying to connect throughout with the person I was missing the most after so many years of navigating through darkness which I was pretty comfortable with I started to feel the need for some kind of change, not just as an artist, but also as a person. I went to see a shaman and then a healer a little bit later, hoping that it would have a positive effect on me. Bit by bit, the change in my work started to show. Nothing dramatic though, more of a gentle coming to the surface, a restored balance within myself, a balance between the masculine and the feminine, and between light and dark. Inspired by my wife, who appeared in a few pieces, I created some new artwork based on the moon and the feminine energy. I had finally found a way to be fully myself. If it wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't be a professional artist today. She could see how much of myself I was putting on canvas. When I moved to England to live with her, she gave me a spare room to use as a studio. She said to me, if it's what you want to do, go for it. Well, that's all I needed. Now, I want to pursue my dream and do more of what makes me happy. And that is music. It's always been my greatest passion. I put it on hold for so long. And it would probably still be on a shelf somewhere if I hadn't been given an extraordinary opportunity to say goodbye to my father at a private ceremony in my hometown. It prompted me to open my keyboard and compose my first ever piece of music. My dad was a musician, so it felt like the only thing to do, really. Who knows what would have happened if things had turned out differently. If we'd all been together, it's hard to know, I don't think. I don't think I would have started to paint. No, I wouldn't have been a painter. <laughs> there would have been no drive, you see, no quest, nothing worth saying. So, in a way, I owe a lot to my father. <laughs>